Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and it is time for part two of the Monday Q&A. And I noticed, I just looked at the footage from part one, because I just did it a few minutes ago, and realized this angle doesn't look particularly fantastic. I look really a lot fatter than usual. But you know what, that's okay, because a lot of the people who watch these Q&As, they don't even watch them, they listen to them at work. So all you guys care about is the audio and the info. And if you need something entertaining and beautiful to look at, I got Bagpuss sitting right here for you. And he's more aesthetic than all of us put together. Look at those striations, those lines. You can't beat that. I can't compete with that. I don't think any of you can either. And if you think you can, you're lying. All right, so let's get into these questions. First question. If one were to train lower body once a week due to being in season and practicing and playing rugby five days a week for at least an hour each day, how would one go about doing that? All right. As I've said before, that's why I have like that off-season program, and I say it's very different from an in-season. Yeah, with five days of playing rugby in-season every week, I don't think you're going to get more than about one good squat session in. So what I would recommend is focus on maintaining your maximum strength. Don't focus on training stamina or any of that, because that five hours of rugby minimum a week is going to give you all the stamina you need. In terms of your playing ability, don't worry about that in the gym. Get that one training session in. Focus on maximum strength, one to three reps. Now, because you're only getting one in, you want to get more than one set. In a minimum of three sets, I'd consider as many as eight sets, depending on how you're recovering. Now, particularly what I would do is get a day off after that. So if you, if you end up doing a really high volume with it, I'd recommend something like you do your, your rugby Monday. If you do it Monday through Friday, Come in and do that on Saturday so you could do as many as eight sets of, of heavy squats if you need to, and then have Sunday off to rest. Now, if that's not really an option for you, you might need to cut down to something like three by three. But the main thing is trying to work at at least 85%, around 85%, maybe as high as 90% of your training maxes, but I'd even be leery of that to some extent when you're in season at the moment. But a three by three with 85% might be really good might be able to go a little higher and do up to eight singles or eight triples if you can take the next day off. So it's going to depend on how you're able to schedule that. But the main thing to remember is just focus on maintaining your peak strength on your squats and your deadlifts and leave it at that. You're only trying to maintain strength with your weight training in season. That's the best you can hope for is that you can focus on staying peak for the season and not worry about your, your max squat increasing or anything that much or trying to gain muscle. It's not going to happen. It's going to negatively impact your gaming. All right, next question. Does the distribution of muscle fiber types in an individual type 1 versus type 2A versus 2B influence the type of strength training that would be most beneficial to them, i.e. as in low reps versus high reps, high volume slash low volume? The answer is honestly probably not or very minimally, and that's the problem we run into when I've seen people try to do this genetic testing and then try to determine how they should train. No, this genetic testing might tell you what you're going to be good at, but it's not going to tell you what's going to make you grow the most because irrespective of what your fiber distribution looks like, certain fibers have a tendency and ability to grow better than others, but you can't change their their rate coding. The, the way that fibers fire and recruit is a progressive thing, and it's the same no matter what you do. You can't change the rate at which they recruit or in terms of order, it's sequential. It's always sequential. You always go from the slowest switch to the fastest switch up a pattern. As soon as one isn't strong enough to handle the load that you're trying to do or the rep you're trying to do, you're done. As far as all this other stuff goes, as far as intensity versus volume, there's a lot of other factors there. And I would say in terms of muscle fiber distribution being near the top of that list, I don't know. I, I doubt it very seriously that it's going to be. And that's why I don't like people trying to do that sort of testing to determine that. I would say more than anything, a lot of those things have to do with how your body recovers and what your recovery patterns look like more than anything in terms of, of handling volume. And more specifically, what your drug stack looks like, which is part of your genetics, wink, wink. All right, next question. For people with hip mobility issues during back squats, back squat more until mobile enough or do alternatives like box squats, front squats, unilateral movements, etc. 
if your hip mobility is preventing you from doing back squats, you need to be doing body weight squats or light weight squats with just a barbell until you get mobile enough. Now, for some people, I would consider doing squats to a box or box squats in order to help with that. But the thing is, you need to be doing something that very closely resembles that. Now, I'm not sure how doing a front squat would necessarily be any different than a back squat for that or how that would really help you if it was a mobility issue because then you're dealing with learning the technique of a front squat, which is more complex on top of it. And most novices don't have the core strength and thoracic erector strength to properly load front squats heavy. So uh, it wouldn't be my option at all. I would consider maybe start starting them squatting down to progressive boxes to get lower over the course of about a week or two weeks. And if that doesn't seem like the best option for that person, then just teaching them to squat with uh, their body weight. If they can squat with their body weight, it's a fear issue and a technique issue preventing them from getting low enough. It's not a hip mobility issue. So start with body weight and then if they're strong enough and you need the weight of a bar to help push them down, which would be a mobility issue. Like if they can't get to depth with their body weight due to their hips not being able to drop low enough, then it's probably a hip mobility issue, in which case doing back squats to get them lower would be the route to go, but alternatively you could do it with progressively lower boxes with just an empty barbell. But as far as the unilateral movements and front squats, I just don't see how that would be particularly beneficial because your goal should be to get them mobile enough to do a proper depth back squat as quickly as possible. You want to do it in as few weeks or days as possible, and you're only going to get there by squatting. All right, next question. Would you recommend maintaining slash starting powerlifting into slash through retirement or a less intense style of training. You know what? If you want to powerlift in retirement, you're 65 and older, I say go for it. What I would recommend, though, is that you proceed with caution. Ease into it. If you've never powerlifted, you're going to want to ease into it very, very slowly with a general strength program. Build up your bone density. Build up your technique before you jump in and actually power lift to try to hit even training maxes on the big three but i see no reason why older gentlemen and women can't do that there are quite a few who do i've met quite a few who are retirement age who are successful power lifters who are injury free and they feel like it adds to their quality of life so why this would be a negative is beyond me other than injury chances but you can have a high chance of injury off using a machine the main thing is to look at is make sure that you're not loading the workloads excessive and that you are giving yourself time to recover and to build particularly things like the bone density up which is going to help you build bone density but you don't want the load placed on the bones from the training to exceed the density that you've created there so you really need to pay attention to things like bone pain and joint pain things like that but there's no reason you can't improve your quality of life while competing in powerlifting even if you start training at an older age and doing it injury free, you just have to be aware of the chance of injury due to your age and just pay attention to it. But as long as you stay injury free, it's going to reduce your chance of getting hurt and all other life endeavors. It's going to improve your quality of life and it'll give you something competitive to do as you get older. And that's the main thing. I think for, for most people who retire, when they run out of social things to do in an environment with other people, that's when retired people really seem to just degenerate and, and die off. But those who find something to do in the community and it's part of a social networking group and powerlifting can give you that. In my experience watching them over the years, someone who's been around a while, those are the people who thrive past their retirement age. They get into their 70s and their 80s and they're still vibrant, thriving people. So would I consider competing in powerlifting for someone who's at retirement age and up? Oh, absolutely. As long as it's done safely, it could, it could probably improve your longevity and quality of life. So go for it. All right, next question. How best can someone maintain performance on the big three when on a vacation where the only accessible facilities are a dumbbell rack and some machines? Well, best of luck with that. Although the thing is, most people's vacations are a week, two weeks at the most. Now, if it goes up to two weeks, you're going to lose a little bit no matter what you do live with it it'll come back real fast if it's only a week treat it as a deload and come in and rather than try to mess with these silly dumbbells and things try squatting a friend or your girlfriend or someone you meet there have them climb on your back 
take a backpack in there and load as many as several of the dumbbells into that backpack and squat that. Same thing on deadlifts. Find something heavy to pick up for a deadlift that's heavier than the dumbbells you have in there. And if all you have is the dumbbells and dumbbell deadlift them, on the bench press, you could do dumbbell floor presses. So at least you're trying to train the same motor patterns, even if it's just with a lighter weight, and that will help you maintain it. And if it's, if it's lighter and it's only for a week, you could be treated as a deload, and you might come back just as strong, if not stronger, after that. And if it's up to two weeks, that will at least help maintain 99% of your performance if you do that. So that's what I would recommend. I mean, do work with what you have available, but try to maintain the same motor patterns of the big three with as much weight as you can actually find and get away with safely. All right, next question. An elaboration on the health benefits and argued performance enhancing effects of alkalinizing your blood, lemons slash water slash veggies. All right, this is complete nonsense used to sell books. This is, I don't know why people still bring this up and talk about this like you can actually do it. Your diet, you can't really affect your diet through that. Now, we could argue a bit about large amounts of tissue proteins and need phosphate and needing extra calcium due to bone issues, but your body will always keep itself at the right pH in your bloodstream no matter what you eat. You can't impact that. It's just that sometimes your body will have to use other resources to keep it where it wants it, but you can't push it out of that range, that very, very narrow range without killing yourself in a very short period of time. You can't do it with your diet. The human body has at this point, we're such a complex species and even species way less advanced than us have this down perfectly of, of using proper buffers to maintain pH balance in their body unless you're really sick and there's something preventing you from doing that, some major medical condition, it's going to happen no matter what you eat. It's, it's just silly and it's not based upon anything real. So please just forget that. Forget you ever heard it. You'll be better off. All right, next question. Risk slash benefit ratio of the guillotine press. For those who don't know, the guillotine press is a bench press with your elbows flared way out wide and lowering the bar to, to your neck. Hence, it's a guillotine that can cut your head off. The risk versus benefits. Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you the benefits. The benefits are that in some cases it may give you slightly better chest stimulation than a, a barbell bench press. The risk, it will destroy your shoulders eventually. Not maybe, not possibly. It will almost certainly, if you do the exercise long enough, it might take six months for one person, it might take 10 years for another, but if you do this exercise long enough, you will seriously injure your rotator cuffs and you will probably need to have surgery on them to fix them. It is, even though it can help you with your chest a little bit, it is a stupid exercise and there's no reason to ever do this exercise if you care at all about your longevity, your shoulder health and not needing surgery. So there's no reason in ever doing this exercise. I don't recommend it at all for anyone in spite of the fact that it can give you pretty good muscle development. There's just no reason to do it. The, the risk to benefit ratio is astronomically high. And there's other exercises that can build your chest. It's not the only thing that can build your pecs. So that means there's no reason to do it. So the guillotine press, absolutely out. Don't do it, please. I do not recommend it or advocate it. And I would never do it personally. All right, last question of the week. George Lehman's psychology for training, i.e. lifting because of psychological trauma and depression, and manipulating that pain to push yourself in the gym to extremes. Is it healthy? No, it's not healthy. And George Lehman will be the first to tell you that the things that he does to be as good as he is are not healthy, that it is destructive to him as a person. It's destructive to his health, everything that he does. Is it a major factor in his success? Yes. And do I respect George's accomplishments and his drive? Absolutely. He, he is stronger than I and the majority of you out there can ever even dream of being. George is a phenomenal athlete and he has a, a drive and a motivation that is inhuman. But is what he does healthy and the way that he channels and the way that he lives in pain, and again, manipulating that pain to push himself in the gym, is that healthy for you as a person? No, probably not. Would that possibly help you win some medals and things later? Yes, absolutely. But you're not going to be a happy person for it. Again, if you talk to George, he'll be one of the first to tell you that 
if he could be happy doing anything else, he would do something else. So put that in perspective. You don't want to be psychologically where, where George is. It's not something that you should strive to do or be there by choice. And there's probably better therapeutic options out there than what George does. And it's only responsible for me to tell you that, that you shouldn't go that route. But do, do I still respect his accomplishments and the fact that he is just insanely strong? Yeah, absolutely. Guy is an amazing strength athlete. So I have nothing but respect for that fact. I just wouldn't recommend that you put yourself in the same psychological mindset that, that George is in. There are better ways to deal with your trauma than, than the way that he goes about it. Get some therapy. All right, guys, so that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it has been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time. But let me give you guys a bicep shot before I go. Oh, Mount Bicepius.